we're now going to move down into the thoracic cavity and we're going to start with uh, one of several procedures uh, talking about decompression of a tension pneumothorax. There's different options of uh, decompressing a tension pneumo. Most of you were taught during your training using the old angiocath method. Um, so you needed a large bore angiocath, uh, as large you could, as you could find. You would uh, find the second or the second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. So here's the patient's clavicle. You go right in the mid, so mid-clavicular line, right below the clavicle, find the second intercostal space, and you'd use the old traditional angiocath. Now the problems with the angiocaths are they very easily kink, as you can see there. Once they've kinked, they're of no use to you. They're also relatively short. This is only a couple centimeters. In today's age, with the typical size of our patients, it's very difficult to get this catheter to make it through all, this, all the soft tissues that you need to actually get to the pleural cavity and perform a decompression. So there were a lot of failures with this old method. Fortunately, in today's day and age, we have a new uh, device available called the Turkle. This is a, a, a typical Turkle device. It's uh, basically a small trocar chest tube. As you can see, you've got a tube down here. It's got little tiny fenestrations in it, little holes that will help you vent the pleural cavity. You've got a cutting needle that's actually inserted here in the little device. If you have a chance to play with one of these, there's a little device at the end that allows you to tell whether or not you're in the soft tissue of the patient's chest wall or if you're in the pleural cavity. If you look up here, you can see a green indicator here. As I depress the end of this, it turns red. That, which would be indicative that I'm inside the patient's chest wall, not in the pleural cavity, not where I need to be. And then when I pop into the patient's lung, it turns back green, indicating that you're in a good position. Now, if, watch as I slide this off. I can bend this almost back on itself. I can almost tie itself into a knot, and there is no kink there. All right, so you know this can get inside the chest and can bend off to one side. Maybe as the lung re-expands, it, it starts to push up on it. It's not going to kink off at that point. This is a much better tube. It's a again, you can look at it as a mini chest tube. It's also nicely marked with centimeter markers, so you can know how far you're going in. This patient is uh, relatively skinny. You can see the clavicle. You can feel the ribs. You know you're only going to actually get into the chest cavity. It's only going to take maybe three to four millimeters. But on someone that's very thick, you may have to have this buried all the way up to the hub, but at least this gives you an idea of how deep you're going at that point. To kind of put this in perspective, it's a little, it's basically a miniature chest tube. The chest tube that we're using has a small trocar with a sharp tip. Here's the tube part of it with the, the sharp tip. That's what exactly what you have here. You have the small tube. You can see the tube here. And then you have the cutting tip at the end with a removable trocar on it. So these are essentially the same, it's just a smaller chest tube. Now why do we want to use a smaller chest tube in a, in a patient in the field? Well that brings us to the complications of chest tube thoracostomy. If you're performing a needle decompression in the, in, in the chest in the field, you're entering a place in the body that is typically sterile. If you're doing it in the field, you're doing it in a very unclean, unprotected situation, and you're potentially opening this patient up to some very significant risks, including infection. Later on, when the patient's in the ICU recovering from their trauma or from their injury or from their disease process that led to this, they may develop an empyema or a collection of pus in the chest. Uh, they may get a severe uh, sepsis infection where they've got bacteria that you inserted into their chest with this procedure and that's now in their blood. So because you save their life now doesn't mean they're not going to suffer complications from an aggressive procedure in the field later in the ICU. So doing something in as little of an aggressive way as possible but still getting the same outcome is very important when you're choosing which procedure to perform in the field. So if you can accomplish the, the method of decompressing the tension pneumothorax with a small chest tube such as the Turkel, that's much more optimal than performing the open procedure which we'll talk about in our next lesson. So what's our indication for performing this? The indication is always going to be a tension pneumothorax. All right? Now a tension pneumothorax is different than a simple pneumothorax. A simple pneumothorax is if you've collapsed your lung but it's not under pressure. These are very common. We see these after simple uh, procedures that we perform uh, daily in the hospital. We see them after over-aggressive ventilation on a patient with COPD. We see them spontaneously in certain patient populations where they pop a small congenital bleb or a weak spot of the lung, which allows air to enter the chest cavity. So we see a lot of simple pneumothoraces that really ultimately don't require any, any more treatment rather than just oxygen and time. 
where we don't treat them with needles, we don't treat them with chest tubes, we let them resolve on their own. What you don't want to do is you don't want to identify a simple pneumothorax in the field, one that is not causing the patient to be an extremist or in shock, and decompress it. Because that would be an overly aggressive procedure that may not have required any treatment in the hospital, and yet you've now exposed the patient to very significant risks. So, there is a difference between a tension pneumothorax and a simple pneumothorax. How are you going to identify that? In the field, you're going to be looking for hypoactive breast sounds on one side or the other. The side that has the hypoactive breast sounds is typically the side that has the tension pneumo. Okay? Things that can mimic that would be like a right main stem intubation. So you've, you've just intubated the patient and you notice that they have absent breast sounds on the left side of the chest because you've got a right main stem intubation. Well now you may be thinking, well wow, he had breast sounds when I first came up on this patient, but now I don't hear anything on the left side. Think back, did you intubate this patient? Were you aggressive when you put the tube down? Did you put the tube down too far? Did the tube slide down into the right main stem after intubation? These are other things you need to be looking at. Look at the mechanism. So why would this patient have a tension pneumo? Did they just recently have a central line placed on this side? Did they just recently have some type of biopsy on the right side of the chest? Are they a COPD patient where they have weak spots on the lungs from their developing COPD and they were just put on positive pressure ventilation such as BiPAP or they were just intubated and because of aggressive ventilation of the patient they've popped a bleb and they're now accumulating air in the chest? Uh, were they in a motor vehicle accident? Did they suffer significant chest wall injury during that motor vehicle accident? Do they have a large contusion across the chest from hitting the steering wheel or other structures inside the car? Were they stabbed? Did they undergo some type of penetrating trauma to the chest that would have opened a, a pneumothorax? So you have to look at the mechanism. You have to use your head in this circumstance. Is there a mechanism that would give this? Is there a procedure that was just performed, such as overaggressive ventilation, a uh, central line placement, uh, some type of biopsy that would put the patient at risk for developing this? Remember that during your identification of patients in pulseless electrical activity, or PEA, that you always need to think, does this patient have a tension pneumo? That's one of the things that can lead to pulseless electrical activity. So you're handed a patient with pulseless electrical activity, tension pneumothorax should kind of run through your head. and Think about what was the mechanism? How did this patient get sick? Was there a mechanism that would lead you down the road of identifying a tension pneumo? Do they have hypoactive breast sounds like we talked about before? Do they have crepitance? So when you feel the chest wall, you can feel bones and things moving. So the patient really impacted the steering wheel or they impacted the side of the car when the car T-bowed them and they've got multiple rib fractures. They've got crepitance in the chest wall that's telling you that there's rib fractures there that would be a mechanism of a, of a developing a tension pneumothorax. Do they have subcutaneous emphysema, the rice crispy feel underneath the, uh, underneath the skin that would identify that there's an air leak? Unless they have some kind of lacerations to their chest, if their skin is intact and they've got that rice crispy feel, the only place that air is coming from is coming from inside the lung. Now just the presence of these things, so the absent breast sounds, the crepitance, the sub-Q air, that doesn't mean they have a tension pneumo. It may mean they have a pneumothorax, and you may have identified that, but a tension pneumo requires another thing. That requires shock. Okay, So this patient should be tachycardic or hypotensive or both. They should be an extremist. They may have JVD. So you look up at their neck and you see that these huge jugular veins dilated and blue because they're being, they, the, the right side of the heart cannot fill because that tension pneumo has pushed the mediastinum over. It's pushed the right ventricle flat so no blood can get into the heart. The left ventricle is still pumping hard so it's filling up the venous side so the, the veins in the neck are distending. You may see tracheal deviation as the whole mediastinum is pushed from one side to the other. You may see this whole trachea start to push to the other side. Those are late findings. And if you see those, the patient should already be an extremist, should already be showing signs of shock. Some of this needs to be present for you to make the diagnosis of a tension pneumo. You shouldn't be finding, oh, I've got some, I've got some uh, subcutaneous emphysema, and they hit the steering wheel, but their vital signs are 120 over 80, their heart rate's 90, and they feel mildly short of breath. They may have a simple pneumo at that point, and that simple pneumo may be on its way to becoming tension, but you, you don't want to be decompressing simple pneumothoraces in the field. 
So you've done the hard part now. You've determined that the patient has a tension pneumothorax. The patient's in shock. The patient has a mechanism consistent with developing a pneumothorax of some type. They've got findings consistent of that. Hypoactive breath sounds, JVD, tracheal deviation, crepitance, subcutaneous emphysema. You've determined that they don't have a right mainstem or a left mainstem intubation that's trying to trick you into that. You've determined that it's not a simple pneumothorax. Their vital signs are grossly unstable. And so you've, you've now done the hard part and now it's time to do the procedure. Um, if you have a turcal available I'd strongly recommend you proceed with the turcal. Again as we talked about before an angiocath will work. I would strongly urge that you use the longest angiocath you have available. Um, sometimes you're able to get the, the, the large 14 gauge 5.25 inch angiocast so this can pretty much get into any uh, chest cavity out there. Just remember if the patients uh, of large body habitus these small angiocasts that were common years ago and what we always used to use are not going to make it into the pleural cavity. So identify your turcal. Handling of the turcal is very important here. Where I see the biggest mistake with use of the turcal is that people grab onto the turcal where they think they want to hold it, which is down here on this nice round structure. And the first time you hold it, the first time I held one, the first time you hold one, that's where your fingers are going to naturally go. It's just, it's a nice spot to hold it. The problem is, when you hold it there, you're actually on the catheter portion of it. And I want you to watch this. As I try to insert this into the chest cavity, all it does is the catheter slides down over the cutting portion of the needle, but you don't really enter the chest cavity. Notice how this actually backed out a little bit. I can push that back in. The cutting portion and the needle portion is actually back here. And what they've done is a nice little curved out spot superior to where that, uh, that round portion where everyone wants to hold. And it's a nice little spot where you can kind of hold the turkle like a dart. And that's how you should hold it, just like a dart in that curved portion up on the cutting portion, the needle, the trocar, if you would, of the, of the turcal. All right? So this is how you want to hold it. Do not hold it down here, or you're going to have problems inserting the, the, the turcal device into the patient's chest cavity. And if you're having problems getting it to insert, it doesn't feel like it wants to go, check yourself. Oh, I'm holding it in the wrong spot. Come up to the, the proper position on the, on the wall. Identify your landmarks. So again, you've got the sternum here. You've got the shoulder here. You've got the patient's clavicle. We go mid-clavicular line. So right here, middle portion of the clavicle. Come off the clavicle, find that second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. You're going to find that rib. Now you want to go over the uh, top of the rib, not underneath the rib. Ribs have a nice little groove underneath them where the nerve, artery, and vein run. If you go underneath the rib and you angle it at all, you're going to cut through one of those structures or all three of those structures leading to multiple complications including hemorrhage inside the chest or a large numb area across the patient's chest wall. So again, find that, find that rib, find that inner space. So the inner space, you're going to find a hard rib and you're going to find a, a dimple and you're going to find another hard rib. Find that inner space, the little soft spot between that. And sometimes you really have to push hard on this patient. And you're not meaning to hurt them, but you've got to get enough pressure down into that chest cavity that you can find those landmarks. So find that inner space. Find the top of that rib by pushing down on it. Now I know exactly where I am. All right. You're going to clean the chest cavity at this point um, using either an alcohol swab or a chlorhexidine wipe. Clean the chest, chest wall cavity. Some people advocate making a small little nick, so a scalpel of any type, you can just make a tiny little nick in the chest cavity. You do not have to do that. Uh, most patients, their skin is thin enough that just using the needle itself that's, that's already on the turcal will get through the chest cavity, but at making a small nick, just basically a little tiny nick like that is all you need to kind of penetrate the, the skin. That's all you need. So you've cleaned it, you've made a small little nick in the skin, or you've just cleaned it and you've got your landmark. I find the top of that rib again, and I insert this right on the top of the rib. Notice that as I've entered the chest cavity, this is red. All right, that means I'm in the soft tissue. I'm not in the pleural cavity at this point. I'm gonna insert down. I'm still in the chest cavity, it's still red, still red, still red. Oh, it just popped green, okay? So I'm now inside the chest cavity. There's a space there, so I'm in, a, in a, I'm in a cavity. Now I'm just gonna go in just a millimeter or two more because you just wanna make sure you're totally in the chest cavity. You don't wanna bury it at this point because you don't wanna stab that needle into the patient's lung, creating another defect into the patient's lung. But another two millimeters to make sure you're completely in the cavity and you're not gonna insert your catheter between the pleura. Because there's a parietal pleura and a parenchymal pleura. And if you, you don't, you wanna make sure it's inside the parietal pleura, the pleura that's um, above the lung and not on the chest wall. Once you're, you're sure you're in, you've got the nice green indicator that, that, that there's nothing pushing on that needle, you then insert the catheter off your needle. 
At this point, you would have also already heard potentially a gush of air. Another, another nice device on the Turkle needles, if you, if you take a chance to look at it, at the very top of the Turkle, you'll see a little, it almost looks like a little triangular white wedge. What that is, is a little Heimlich valve essentially. And so air can come in, you've entered the chest cavity here, air shoots up here, and that's designed to allow you to hear it. Okay, so you should hear air escaping. It's, it'll go like, pssst, you know, make a nice whistling sound in certain instances. That may, may be enough to start decompressing it, but actually when you pull this needle out, and then you open the, the catheter, you're gonna get a large gush of air, all right? And that's another important fact here. Once you pull this needle out, this is another closed system. This is closed off. This little, there's a little valve that shuts off in here, so you have to open it, all right? And there's a nice little, you have the little uh, three-way valve down here, just open it, and then this allows air to come out of this side port right here, all right? Now it's an open system. The lungs should be de decompressed at this point. You'll hear that rush of air slowly taper off. If you've heard that, you should be done. You should have treated the patient at this point. If you don't think you've got a complete decompression, leave this in position and you can do another one, okay? Maybe you have a trauma victim that has bilateral pneumothoraces. You may end up having to decompress both sides of the chest. The method would be the exact same. Um, this would be a, typically a very sick patient that doesn't completely improve and has hypoactive breast sounds on both sides and again has a mechanism consistent with having bilateral tension pneumothoraces. Okay? But you can use more than one turkle on one side. You may have to use two turkles on either side if, if there's the correct indication that they have bilateral tension pneumothoraces. Realize that's very rare. Another uh, condition that I would advocate where you may want to have decompressed both sides of the chest. So you, you've, you've come up onto a patient that may have suffered penetrating trauma to the chest. They arrested right before your arrival. Uh, so you, you know, the, the paramedics that initially got there are telling you, hey, this patient was just alive. They've just suffered a stab wound to the chest and they went down right before us. And you decompress one side, you don't get them back. They're still in arrest. Decompress the other side at that point. So if you've got the correct mechanism, the patient is in a PEA arrest and they were just alive before you got there, that's an indication where you may want to decompress both sides of the chest before you say that they have suffered a, a, a traumatic arrest at that point and end up calling the arrest on, in the field. Um, and Turkle is a great option for that because it's a non-invasive or a, a semi-non-invasive method of decompressing the chest without opening the chest cavity. Complications you're going to have with this, false passage so you don't get the catheter in or it, divide, it goes into the chest wall and therefore doesn't decompress the, the thoracic cavity. Uh, infection is a huge thing so make sure you clean the chest wall. Uh, you can get nerve, artery and vein injury if you didn't go over the top of the rib and you hit the bottom structures that are in that groove underneath the rib on the inside of the chest cavity. You can cause damage to the lung itself so if you insert that needle and you keep going and you insert that needle all the way in, well that needle is going to hit that lung, cap, that lung that's underlying there that's collapsed and it's going to cause damage. It's going to basically cause a hole in the lung and it's going to make, make that patient have a chest tube for a longer period of time in the ICU. So again, you just want to enter it just far enough that you make sure you're in the chest cavity but you're not entering that needle and causing further damage to the tissues underlying that. Once this is in, you're going to want to secure it to the chest cavity and just a piece of tape around here to the chest is, is sufficient. We have a nice adapter that then you can a, a, apply to the three-way valve that you have down here. Again, if you do that, you have to make sure it's in line and it's open so that it's not a closed system. If it's across it like this, if it's across it like that, that's a closed system. You just close this off again. So you've got to make sure this is open. Air should be able to freely move from this. So once you've got to this point, you've got your turcal in position, you have your adapter valve hooked up, you've got your, your little catheter here, you've made sure that it's in line here, it's not like this. Again, that would be a closed situation. Then you can attach your, tur or your Heimlich valve. Heimlich valve has a blue side and a clear side. You can see there's a little wedge inside there. And it's a valve. Air can come this way, but it can't come this way. And if you see on the side here, it tells you what the direction of flow is. It says flow, there's an area, arrow, and it very nicely tells you that air can come this way and air cannot come this way. Once you put this on, it's still an open, meaning air can come out of the chest cavity. You're just not allowing the dust, bacteria, everything else to enter the patient's chest cavity. We actually send patients home from the hospital with a setup identical to this. So once you've done this, this is a, you know, a very, a uh, very adept way of treating a tension pneumo that you've now converted to a simple pneumo by decompressing it and you can have, you now have maintenance therapy because air can continue to come out so if this patient's intubated and you're bag valving from above meaning the patient's on positive pressure ventilation or you've got them on uh, 
uh, BiPAP from above, so they're on a form of uh, positive pressure ventilation, and there's an air leak inside there, so air is continuing to accumulate. Air that is continuing that you're pushing into the chest can there therefore come out, but you're not going to get dirty contaminants into the chest cavity. Oftentimes, if you do this in the field, the patient is going to require a chest tube thoracostomy when they get to the emergency department. But if you can save them the chest tube thoracostomy, which is a much more dangerous open procedure that puts the patient at significant risk for infection, you're doing your patient a lot more good than by doing a very aggressive, very, uh, very dirty surgical procedure in an uncontrolled situation.